people were chained, they were beaten, they were stuck, cut, they were bled. And they would give themselves freely for this. I remember just constant, absolute terror. And I can't explain how intense, how strong, how all-encompassing that terror is. Unless you do this, you're going to get killed. You're going to die. I watched them take the lives of children. I watched them take the life of my twin brother. They didn't deserve to live, you know? They begged by their actions to be killed. This is inhuman. It's absolutely inhuman. I myself would like to go and crawl back into a corner and say this doesn't happen. People simply don't believe that this stuff goes on. If we don't educate one another, uh, it's going to be the crime of the 90s. Satanism. To most, it conjures images of medieval black masses or sinister deeds done for the devil. But simply said, Satanism is the belief that evil is excusable and attaining power to control people and circumstances is desirable. Whether you believe in a literal devil is not important in understanding Satanism's effect on our society. The evidence is in. Satan worship and satanic cults are growing rapidly, and adherents of these ideas are becoming more vocal and more dangerous. These symbols of Satanism are turning up everywhere, on walls, on clothes, on album covers, and even on bodies of murder victims. Law enforcement officials admit that satanic cults operate in nearly every community in America. Young children from Oregon to Massachusetts say they've been raped, tortured, and forced to watch small animals killed during satanic ceremonies. School officials in many cities report high school students are forming satanic groups. A Chicago policeman told us, satanic crime makes gang activity look like a nursery school. During this program, you will see the many sides of Satanism. You'll be shocked. And you may be tempted to turn away in denial of such unspeakable horror. If you think I'm exaggerating, watch closely. Listen to what is being done in the name of Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Those were the words of Night Stalker Richard Ramirez. Ramirez is the Satan worshiper who now sits on California's death row after being convicted of 13 brutal murders. Ramirez often left satanic symbols at the scenes of his crimes, carving a pentagram on the body of one victim and on the bedroom wall of another. In his formal statement to the court at his death sentence hearing, Ramirez said, quote, Legions of the night, I will be avenged. Lucifer dwells within us all. In San Francisco, former waiter Clifford St. Joseph was found guilty of murdering a man during an apparent satanic ritual. The victim's body had all the signs. A pentagram had been carved in his chest, the body had been drained of its blood, he'd been sexually abused, and one of his testicles had been cut off. In Dade County, Florida, Frank Fuster and his wife were convicted of ritually abusing children at the daycare center they operated in their home. Children at the center said the Fusters made them drink urine, eat feces, and engage in sex acts during preschool games. The case horrified the community, and the prosecutor called the Fusters systematic abuse of the children, quote, outrageous. And in the longest trial in American history, 
children who attended the mcmartin preschool in manhattan beach california told of seeing teachers in dark robes watching small animals kill playing sexual games drinking blood and eating feces in a trial that many say was botched none of the defendants was found guilty but seven of the twelve jurors said they believed the children had been abused and virtually every expert familiar with the case believes a satanic cult was operating out of the school. Of all the crimes committed in the name of Satan, the most heartbreaking involved children. For young victims of Satanism, the joy of childhood gives way to pain, darkness, and fear. Sometimes that pain comes from strangers, sometimes from their own families. We've talked with a number of adults who tell stories of being raised in families where satanic rituals were part of everyday life. For many adult survivors, their childhoods were filled with torture, sexual abuse, cannibalism, and murder. I was forced to help kill other children. I was forced to participate in their cannibalism. Esther grew up on the East Coast. Today, she lives thousands of miles away. But her childhood memories of bizarre satanic rituals remain. In the outside world, her parents were active members of their community, involved in church, school, and organizations like Little League and Girl Scouts. But on the inside, behind closed doors, they and other members of their satanic cult forced Esther to endure repeated ritualistic attacks on her body and her mind. There was a circle, and I was put in the middle of the circle, and there was a fire around me. Um, and um, during that part, I was told I was being married to Satan and being a child of Satan forever and um, that kind of stuff. And then um, I was pulled out to the front of the circle beyond the fire and um, then raped by the men in the cult. Most vividly, I recall about torture. I remember a lot of it very vividly being tied hand and foot and burned on my genitals. Karen grew up across the country from Esther. Her parents were also well regarded in their community, but they too led a dark and secret life from which Karen is still struggling to recover. Today, she edits a national newsletter for other survivors of satanic cults. Karen's abuse was so extreme, she often passed out from internal hemorrhaging and pain. She remembers being raped by cult members, shut away for hours in a dark, scary place. It was actually a closet in a welded wire cage, and the bottom of the cage would be opened. That would be how I would be put in it and suspended in a closet. And uh, they, it was a very simple thing that they did. They just set a board inside the door and then dumped a bunch of snakes in on the floor, which I could see. They were probably even harmless snakes but I was a child, and uh, then they shut the door and left me in there in the dark, and I could hear it. Um, I was forced to eat human waste, yes. Christy also it's suffered it's horrible it's abuse it's at the hands of her family and their satanic cult. Even as a toddler, Christy says her parents forced her to participate in gruesome rituals, drinking blood, eating feces, and killing children. Christy finally escaped from her family and underwent years of therapy. Now she can talk calmly about the years of abuse she suffered at the hands of her Satan-worshipping parents. I remember being drug out of bed at midnight and taken to this dark uh, cemetery where they would have rituals going on, uh, satanic services or um, various things, and there'd be people chanting and the black robes. And I remember one of the first experiences as a teenager where I watched them sacrifice um, a little boy and he was blonde hair, blue eyes, just this beautiful little boy and he was about five years old and he was groomed for this and they constantly said to him don't cry, don't cry, this is what you were born for. I did find myself um, scre screaming out at the injustice of it and the high priest at one point came out over and tried to shut me up and I said to him God's gonna get you for this and he took me from the tree where I had been tied to to observe and put me in a pit 
and in this pit there were um, the remains of human sacrifices, of babies, of animals, and snakes that they used in the various ceremonies. And in this pit, they put a cover over it and left me there for quite some time. I'm not sure how long. I lost track of time. I n no longer knew when it was daylight or when it was dark because of the covering. And every so often, they'd come and just take the covering off and just stand at the top of this pit and taunt me, where is your God now? And they threw um, human flesh, baby flesh down. And that's what I was to survive on if I was to survive. They made it to be like it was a great privilege to eat the bodies. I mean, the, the girl that I had to kill, they treated me like I was being given a great gift when they gave me a part of her body that I had to eat. I remember being horrified, but knowing that my horror would not let me survive and that I had to put my horror somewhere else. The same thing happened when um, I had to have um, oral sex with a bunch of dogs, you know, that what they were doing was they were cutting out the dog's penises and stuff and they made me have oral sex to bring out the penis so that they could cut them off and um, I had to do that. I, I know that there were at least 12 dogs in there and there might have been more. I mean, I, I never really stopped to count. I just remember that there were a lot of them. Um, and, you know, I couldn't have any reaction and I couldn't, I couldn't go throw up and wash myself and all those things I wanted to do because I would be punished or killed. They threatened me constantly with loss of life uh, my own life, the lives of others. I watched them take the lives of children. I watched them take the life of my twin brother uh, when we were just four. I watched them kill animals. And then as I grew, um, grew up, the threats became a little bit more subtle. It was always just don't talk. Um, and that was real hard to deal with, you know, because people say, well, why didn't you ever say anything? Well, when you have such vivid memories of seeing your brother die, then you know not to talk. Yeah, I wish it had never happened. I wish it never happened to anybody. I wish um, the losses have been tremendous. Uh, the pain has been overwhelming. The struggle has been a lifetime, a lifetime of struggle. The incredible stories told by survivors come out in words and in the artwork they create. Sometimes the art is done as part of therapy. Sometimes it occurs during a private moment when a survivor tries to make sense of what's happened. These drawings by survivors from all over the country reflect similar memories of torture and rape at the hands of satanic cults. Baby killings, ritualistic rape, cannibalism. It seems like the stuff of supermarket tabloids or trash TV. We could dismiss all of this easily, except for so many similar stories told by so many survivors. The reality of Satanism is even more believable when you talk to reputable therapists like those here at Columbine Hospital in Denver, Colorado. They believe the survivors are telling the truth. Linda Young is a psychiatric nurse who works with adult survivors of satanic cults. Her goal is to help them move beyond the trauma of their experiences into healthy, happy lives. Most of these people come to us thinking what's happened to them isn't true. Um, they don't want it to be true, so they go back and forth. We call it the true, not true experience. Um, when they're in a memory, they know it's true, and then they let the emotion out and it's very true and then the emotion goes away and they say oh maybe it didn't happen so that letting the world know that it's true 
many of them know that that will never happen or it's a very good possibility in our lifetime that most people will not ever begin to believe that this is really going on. It's very important for them that they know that I believe them, that I know this happened to them, that I have no doubt that this happened to them. All right, this is one where we have backward writing. Dr. Walter Young is head of the unit that treats adult survivors at Columbine, one of the few inpatient units in the entire United States. Dr. Young has treated or consulted on about a hundred such cases. Today, he receives referrals from therapists throughout the country. I guess the thing that's most compelling to me as a clinician is to hear reports from a variety of patients who do not have contact with each other who report very similar stories and stories which are shocking and alarming about uh, murder and sacrifice of human beings, cannibalism, uh, sexual promiscuity, uh, in what appears to be a very ritualized, planned setting, uh, using not only children, both boys and girls, but adults as well. We also hear similarities uh, in reporting of being buried alive and then being unearthed and told that they've been reborn in the name of Satan. We have stories of people being married to Satan in marriage ceremonies. There are repeated reports of serial sexual assaults with the impregnation of a young adolescent and the destruction of that child, often by the mother itself, in the name of Satan. More recently, we're beginning to hear more specific techniques of indoctrination and torture. Torture is very frequently used to, to, one, strengthen the individual to maintain secrecy within the cult, that is intimidation. Uh, it's also uh, considered something to be desired by cult, that is to, the toleration of pain, the mixing of pain and sexual experiences and blurring the boundaries between them. But it's, quote, to make a good soldier for Satan. What we are dealing with at this point, in my belief anyway, is a well-organized religious and cult-based group that is wide, wide, widespread. Myra Riddell is a private therapist and the driving force behind the Ritual Abuse Task Force of the Los Angeles County Women's Commission. Experts like Riddell are convinced Satanists can be found at every level of society. They are also convinced that the number of practicing Satanists is growing. According to Riddell, it's hard to get accurate information on satanic cults because they exert almost total control over their members and their young victims. There are several purposes to this kind of control. One, it permits the rituals to go on with the complete cooperation of the individual who is, is being sacrificed in whatever way, whether it's being killed or, or, uh, or burned or sexually used for the ritual purposes. And the other is one that concerns many of us a great deal, and that is that these kids who are being this brainwashed are being inculcated into a belief in Satanism on a very basic unconscious level. We, in fact, and they, in fact, are trying to raise a whole generation of Satanists. In the past, Satanic cults have maintained their membership by raising their own children within the cult. Now experts see an alarming new trend. Survivors say that satanic groups are establishing preschools and daycare centers for the sole purpose of recruiting vast numbers of small children. We are hearing from those survivors that there is a deliberate and concerted and well-organized, well-orchestrated effort to infiltrate the preschool system. And here's the spy shark. Psychologist Catherine Gould is known nationally for her work in treating ritually abused children. She's deeply disturbed that Satanists are preying on children at such an early age. The purpose is to achieve an indoctrination at an early formative age when a child is going to be most susceptible to being emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually hooked to the cult and hooked for life. The idea is that you get the child under the age of six, you abuse them, you indoctrinate them, you use them for cult purposes, you break them down, you strip them of any sense of free will, you strip them of any sense of connectedness to family or to positive, the positive parts of society, 
and you have a somebody who functions for the purposes of the cult. And the idea there, of course, is that the cult can call upon that person later in life. Doreen Kenny is one parent who suspects that her daughter was the victim of satanic abuse at a preschool in Southern California. She had stomach aches. She had headaches. She um, would complain about various limbs hurting her. I mean, screaming with pain, just absolutely screaming with pain. Um, night terrors, just horrible, horrible night terrors. She regressed from a three-year-old to a two-year-old, and she was back in diapers. Finally, one day after being in school about six months, a little over six months, she had told my oldest daughter she was poked. And once that came out, I knew because of all the things that had been going on, I just knew in my heart that she had been molested. At first, Kenny assumed her daughter was the victim of sexual abuse and she placed the little girl in therapy. Over many months, however, the real story began to unfold. Kenny discovered that her daughter had been subjected to various forms of sexual and ritualistic abuse that paralleled activities common to satanic cults. Six years later, her daughter is still haunted by fear. The most frightening stuff that is still with her is she believes she's being watched. Every red car and black car that goes by is watching her. Every lady that dresses in blue are kidnappers. They will kidnap kids. Um, these are things that she's been told. She has at, at one point, and as she continues in therapy, gets better and better, but at one point believed very much so that she was a child of Satan and that she actually had Satan's heart put into her. Um, she still has trouble with that when you get palpitations that her heart's going to explode that because she's told. Dr. Roland Summit is a psychiatrist who treats child ritual abuse victims at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. He says many satanic cults use intimidation, fear, and even drugs to make children keep quiet. Children report being given drugs uh, which makes them feel sleepy, makes them forget. They're told they're going to have an operation. When they regain consciousness, they have what looks like a scar, which disappears, a kind of scratch on their skin. And they're told that something has been implanted inside of them. It may be a bomb, it may be the part of an animal that's been killed. And that will know if they're thinking about telling. And it will become armed and it will destroy them. So when children think about telling, and when they get nervous, there's a throbbing in their head, which they interpret as the bomb ready to go off, or a churning in their stomach, which may be the dog chewing at them. And from a child's point of view, they are now booby-trapped against telling. It seems that Satanists will use all sorts of elaborate and insidious schemes to keep their young victims under control. Consider the case of Ed Gellum, a Protestant minister, his wife Mary Lou, and their son Chip. All three were convicted of sexually abusing children at the two preschools they operated in Roseburg, Oregon. The children told stories of ritualistic animal killings and sexual abuse with carrots, bottles, and sticks. Judge William Laswell, who prosecuted the Gallops when he was a district attorney, says the family intimidated their young victims by saying they had magic glasses capable of seeing into the children's homes. Chip, the youngest of the Gallops, had a pair of magic glasses, which is simply, or simply an oversized set of sunglasses you would buy at a carnival. The mother had a set, too, and the, and the father. And the children told us that Chip Gallop would get up on the stage, put the glasses on, turn in the direction of where the child lived, and then make some observation about whether the child finished breakfast, put away his pajamas, uh, left some tracks on the, on the carpet, uh, what would have happened is that Chip would have called the family and, and learned something about what, what happened that morning. And so when Chip told them that he could see into their home and tell them something that they knew had happened, they believed that he in fact could see them and hear them wherever they were. And he had threatened to, to kill their parents and harm them if they talked. In addition, he'd given them a uh, most of them a photograph of himself, which he asked to have displayed in their bedroom so that he was always looking at them that way, too. 
Crimes committed in the name of Satan are beginning to receive special attention by police officials. Several departments have established occult crime units and are learning to spot the evidence of satanic activity. A number of investigators are working to uncover the links between survivor stories and existing cults. Others are looking into the possibility of a national or international conspiracy involving satanic groups. There's much to be learned, and law enforcement officials are just beginning to scratch the surface. But across the country, police investigators agree a disturbing trend is emerging. The most vicious crimes being committed in the name of Satan are being perpetrated by young people in their teens. Pete Rowland and two other members of his satanic cult clubbed a fourth boy to death in the woods of rural Missouri. The group had been practicing satanic rites for years, torturing so many animals to death they lost count of the number. They were obsessed with satanic books, gory movies, and heavy metal music. After the brutal murder, Roland said songs by the rock group Metallica drove him and his friends into a frenzy as they planned the attack. Eddie Krigler, an Arkansas youth, claimed he was acting under direct orders from Satan when he beat his parents with a five-foot club, then stabbed them repeatedly with the same butcher knives he used to perform satanic rites. At the time of the attack, Krigler was recruiting other teenagers to form a satanic cult. In New Jersey, 14-year-old Tommy Sullivan stabbed his mother a dozen times with his Boy Scout knife. After that, Sullivan slit his own throat. Just weeks before the attack, he told a friend that Satan appeared to him in a vision, ordering him to kill his family. For Ricky Casso, involvement in Satanism led to murder and suicide. Casso and his friends formed a cult called Knights of the Black Circle. One night, they turned on another team, Gary Lowers, forced him to say, I love Satan, and gouged out his eyes before stabbing him to death. The day after he was arraigned, Castle hanged himself with a bedsheet. Satanism is on the rise, and it is the crime of the 90s. Randy Eamon is a police officer who spends much of his time investigating crimes that have links to the occult. Eamon believes the lure of Satanism is too powerful for many young people to resist. The danger of Satanism in the occult to society I liken to a narcotic. It's addictive. It's power they're seeking. And when they find out that they toyed with a, a ritual and that ritual worked, they're hooked. It's just like the hook in the side of their mouth is a fish. It takes them one step further and pretty soon the hook is not on the side of their mouth. They have swallowed it completely. And it is a magnet and it is a magnet that they can't go away from. It just draws them further and further and further. And pretty soon, they're not going with just lightweight rituals. They're graduating from uh, candle rituals to wearing the, the, the costumes, uh, the, the regalia with the, the ritual swords. They're going to the black hoods, to the animal sacrifices, and where may that take them? To human sacrifice. Human sacrifice. That's how far Sean Sellers went. Today, Sean is in solitary confinement on death row at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. Sean was just 15 years old when he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death for three cold-blooded murders, including that of his mother and stepfather. Murders he committed in the name of Satan. I was mad at my parents. I was doing destruction rituals, you know, saying, Satan, kill him. Get him out of my life. I tried to move out. They came and got me. wouldn't let me move out. And uh, it just built up to the point where I just, I did it. I, I saw, had this dream over and over again. And I'd kill my parents, you know, as did I'd sacrifice them to Satan in my dream. And uh, like I said this before, I woke up and it wasn't a dream. You know, it was reality. It really happened. The murders took place in this house, in a well-kept Oklahoma City suburb where Sean and his parents lived. On the night of March 6, 1986, dressed in black underwear and a black hooded cape, Sean tiptoed into his parents' bedroom as they slept, pulled out a 44 Magnum revolver, shot them both in the head. Later, he went back to their room, looked at the dead bodies, and laughed. What could have driven a young man to such violence? On the outside, they looked like a happy family. 
but the real story was different. From early childhood on, Sean was shuttled from relative to relative or left with babysitters. At 10, one of those sitters introduced him to Satanism and Sean was hooked. By the time he was in high school, Satanism dominated his life. He formed a satanic coven with a group of his friends. He kept a satanic diary and illustrated it with satanic symbols. He built an altar in his bedroom where he performed secret ceremonies. He wrote incantations to Satan, sometimes in his own blood. And he drank his blood regularly. I began to drink blood because it gave me a rush. It gave me a thrill. You know, it was like, wow, I'm drinking blood, you know. And then I began to like it. You know, the taste of it, just, I liked the taste of it. It was a very strange taste, and I liked it. And it got to the point to where I had to carry blood around with me all the time because if I didn't, I'd get to thinking about it, and that'd be all I could think about. It was like it was craving, like, you know, I needed it. Even at school, there were signs of Sean's deepening involvement in Satanism. When his teacher assigned an essay on how students had grown spiritually, Sean wrote about his dedication to the devil. He even read his satanic books in class, yet no one intervened. It seems like everybody was seeing that something needed to be done, that something was going on, but, and they were going, they were taking steps towards that, but they were all afraid to call my parents or to sit me down or, or whatever and do something, to really make a commitment and do something because it was, maybe it was because they thought if it was, you know, uh, Satanism or something, you know, maybe it was religious and we can't get involved in religious things or whatever. Things continue to get worse until the night of September 8, 1985, when Sean and his friend Richard decided to undertake the ultimate satanic act. We had decided we were going to break all the Ten Commandments to show Satan that we were completely dedicated to him and we only had one more commandment to break, thou shalt not murder. And that's what our, that night was to be. That night was to be this sacrifice, get rid, of, get rid of these people who didn't matter anyway, who were in our way, who by the instructions in the Satanic Bible, you know, said that they didn't deserve to live, you know? They begged by their actions to be killed. I'm on death row. I am at the bottom of the American life, you know? I'm at the bottom. I am the most hated person in America. Death row inmates, nobody likes. Death row inmates have no hope. That's what Satanism has given me. George Berlanger was also seduced into Satanism as a teenager. Now he's 27, stable, married, and the father of a little girl. But his teen years grew violent as he became more and more deeply engulfed in Satanic beliefs. I was going to kill my parents at one point. I took knives and I started down the hall and I was going to cut my parents up and for some reason it stopped. I was very cold, very demanding, very physically violent to my parents. Very physically violent. I used to punch my dad out. I used to hit my mom. I mean the whole night without any remorse at all. At this point, my parents were so afraid of me. They were afraid, they were afraid for their lives. They put a deadbolt lock on their door. That's how afraid they were, in their own house. Like many other teenagers who become heavily involved in Satanism, George came from a troubled family. His father was an alcoholic who abused George and his mother. George took out his anger at school and was expelled at 16. After that, he became totally immersed in Satanism, obsessed with performing rituals, sacrificing animals, and drinking blood. It is a communion to the devil. The way that you ritualistically take the blood, do the spells with the blood, and ingest the blood is is doing a communion to Satan and when you ingest the blood it is to accumulate power it would be more comfortable to think the stories we've heard are fabricated 
or the exploits of a lunatic fringe. But if we believe the experts, Satan worship is undeniably real, and Satan worshipers pose a serious threat to society's well-being. During this program, we've heard from many victims of Satanism about tragic, alarming, and nearly fatal encounters with devil worship. We've listened to those who participated willingly and those who were victimized against their wills. We've heard reports of innocent children raised in a brutal environment of torture and teenagers who were compelled to commit crimes and to kill in the name of Satan. All these accounts could make us question our fundamental faith in the decency and goodwill of humanity. But what we've seen should compel us to act responsibly and address the root causes of this terrible malevolence in our midst. Satanism thrives on secrecy. Its existence depends on concealment. That's why the bravery of the people you've listened to during this program is so phenomenal. They've spoken out. Even under the threat of intimidation, and death. Their courage comes from knowing that breaking the silence will save others from the anguish they endured or committed. Think about the remarkable consistency in all these stories and the blunt honesty of those who have suffered so much. See beyond the atrocity of Satanism. Remember that many victims are still imprisoned by the fear that no one will help them, that no one will believe them. The seduction of Satanism will end when you and I confront this national tragedy by marshalling the forces of our schools, churches, community organizations, law enforcement associations, and social agencies. We must expose all the evil being done in the name of Satan. I'm Bob Larson. And it was all because I thought that Satanism would promote me. I thought that Satanism was the ideal of self-preservation and would make me successful, would make me the person that I wanted to be. That's the biggest lie that I've ever seen. I really believe that survivors need to know that there's hope, that they can live through this. This is my truth as I know it. And I know that I didn't make it up because I know I was there. And I know that there will be people who will never believe it. It's very, very difficult to confront the reality of this because once you confront the reality of this, you feel such a tremendous sense of responsibility to do something. 